House Intelligence Chair Mike Turner praising Speaker Mike Johnson for releasing Capitol footage from January 6, calling the move an important step toward exposing the truth, according to The Hill. He said, quote, when you see the footage yourself, it's going to give you an understanding of what was there and what occurred that day, because we're currently only depending on really partisan descriptions of what happened. Now the American people can see. House Republicans are revitalizing their focus on January 6, as Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene calls for a new select committee aimed at investigating the members of the bipartisan panel that conducted a probe into the attack in the previous Congress and reached, quote, damning conclusions about Trump's role in orchestrating the violence. Elsewhere in Trump land, the former president has threatened to tap a special prosecutor to, quote, go after President Joe Biden and his family fueling alarm from many scholars and ex-Justice Department officials, Harvard professor and co-author of Democracies Die, Stephen Levitsky, likened Trump's actions to authoritarian regimes, saying, quote, this is one of the most openly authoritarian campaigns I've ever seen. You have to go back to the far-right authoritarians in the 1930s in Europe or in the 1970s in Latin America to find the kind of dehumanizing and violent language that Trump is starting to consistently use. This all comes as a recent Emerson College national poll shows that Trump leads Biden by four points in a hypothetical general election matchup, with Trump at 47 percent and Biden at 43 percent. Now, as for the Republican presidential primary, Trump leads at 64 percent, Nikki Haley currently in second place at 9 percent, Ron DeSantis at 8 percent, Vivek Ramaswamy at 5 percent. Um, you know, I always say this whenever we talk about the mainstream media's need to castigate Trump as this unique authoritarian demagogue. Um, mostly they're just pointing out the things he says, which I agree are crude and often mean and are not, you know, things that I would want a presidential candidate to be saying. Uh, that's been clear not just for the last year, but like for the entirety of Trump being on the political map. Uh, but they describe him as this just unique threat to democracy and civil society at the same time that, but Trump is the one who is being prosecuted, who they're attempting to put in jail in four different jurisdictions, um, in part for his speech in other places, for things that may be completely legitimate and reflect um, election malfeasance. And if so, he's doomed and that's fine. But, you know, he is he is in the midst of being persecuted. They describe him as as like he's doing this to other people right now when actually he is the target of a criminal effort to put him in prison. Yeah, I think Trump's statements about the election, you know, not being legitimate in 2020 shows that he doesn't have a lot of respect for the electoral process. But when we talk about a well-functioning democracy, I think it would be more accurate if people held those same criticisms for people like Joe Biden. I mean, 66 percent of the country, when they wanted a ceasefire, he was saying, absolutely, we won't have a ceasefire. President Biden has not done anything to significantly represent working class people in a way that's meaningful. Most people are living paycheck to paycheck. And I think when you have the government not representing the majority will of the people, you don't have a functioning democracy, and, and Joe Biden's guilty of that as well. Democrats are guilty of that as well. I think the fear of Donald Trump is because he says the quiet part out loud and people aren't used to that. Uh, I think also his distrust in the electoral process uniquely makes him someone who is a threat to democracy. If he's going to question all of the elections and rile up his base again, if he doesn't win in 2024, that would be, I think, a really scary moment for our country. But most working class people see that nothing fundamentally changes. You have these candidates come in, promise the world to them, and then their lives don't change materially whatsoever. They're still struggling, living paycheck to paycheck. And so I think maybe the prosecution of Donald Trump is what's turning him into an authoritarian. He would probably rather have control of the courts in the United States of America and maybe their prosecution of him to the extent uh, that it's been is what is making him uh, espouse these things that are categorized as authoritarian. Maybe we're making an authoritarian by prosecuting him. It can be very annoying to have the Justice Department after you. But listen, I think he's thought he's he's above the law for far too long. And I really think what's going on right now is that neither party represents the interests of the American people or, you know, 
it represents a, a well-functioning democracy. Totally. And the media is just is clearly trying to scare people away from Donald Trump. Like, you, you know, you can do anything you want, but you, you can't support Trump because he's so scary and he's he's so bad and he's so authoritarian. And it's just not working. Like he's a, he's ahead of Biden right now in, in the poll, not just the overall polls, but in the key s swing states that Biden needs to win to be reelected. Like nobody believes this anymore. Um, they may, that, and that's not to say that they endorse or like Donald Trump. They're just over the idea that that they'll be living like in hell if he becomes president again, because they care just as you say about the economic reality. Some of them care about uh, foreign policy. Some care about all, all sorts of issues that matter to Americans. And this very abstract Trump's rhetoric threatens democracy. But again, you are the you people making that claim are the ones right now persecuting a political figure, Donald Trump. You might say that it's legitimate, but that's like that's beyond the point that then if, if then you're saying, well, OK, sometimes it's legitimate to persecute political figures. Well, OK, then what's the point of of leaning into this rhetoric that that, that per, political persecution is is so beyond the pale and you can never do it. Well, you are doing it right now. So I think it's totally implausible. And and it's it's similar with that line there that we you know, we covered the idea that you know Trump's going to persecute Biden's family. Like that is such a that is that is clearly we're talking about Hunter Biden here and what we're actually talking about is a legitimate inquiry in whether to the president's son was being used by business interests in Ukraine and China and elsewhere to influence US public policy. Whether Biden knew about that the, to the extent he was involved in, in that with the meetings that he attended and listened into um, the, the story about that censored on X uh, after federal uh, censored on Twitter at the time after federal intelligence officials had warned social media companies about foreign Russian malfeasance and then defended it as bearing all the hallmarks of foreign Russian malfeasance. So like, that's what we mean by by, you know, looking into people's family connection. It's corruption. We're interested in whether there is verifiable corruption here. And to just write that off as, oh, no, this is an attack on Biden's family. Nobody believes that anymore. I think when we look at Trump and the criticism he's gotten for having Jared Kushner get, you know, billions supposedly from the Saudis, and you have people say, this is so outrageous. What an yeah. insane Oh, no, they're going after his family. How dare they? <laughs> Yeah, I think like like people are focusing so much on Donald Trump, like, oh my gosh, how could Jared Kushner take this money from the Saudis? Clearly there's deal making going on with the Saudis who are not great people. But then we look at Joe Biden, who right now, uh, if you're a Palestinian American and you're living in the United States, you're literally watching Joe Biden give permission to Israel, hugging Netanyahu, while families are being slaughtered, entire bloodlines are being lost. And I think they don't really see much of a difference between those two evils. If you're someone who is just a regular person, you're not someone who has always voted with the Democrats, you're not a Democratic Party consultant, you don't really see actually a big difference between a candidate like Donald Trump and a candidate like Joe Biden. And I think that's really a tough pill to swallow for a lot of people who are members of the political class. But look at how much of a plurality of the vote Trump is getting in the polls in a general election. He's holding half of the country. People need to look within themselves and say, huh, there's a reason people like this guy. I think he talked a lot about anti-corruption in the United States, about ending the bureaucratic control of governance. He talked about draining the swamp and unrigging the system. People realize that the system is rigged. And yeah, is Donald Trump a great guy? No. But is Joe Biden either? Are the alternatives that are being proposed by the other party of our two-party system, the Democrats, that much better? And to most American people, there's, there's not a better alternative there. Uh, their lives wouldn't fundamentally change one way or another. And I think that's why so many people are okay with voting for Donald Trump, because they were basically told to leave the Democratic Party by Hillary Clinton when she called the Donald Trump supporters, the white working class supporters that were attending the rallies, deplorable. Uh, they were told, you're basically not welcome here. You're not valued. We don't really see you as a good person. You're deplorable. That's an extreme statement to make. A lot of people left the Democratic Party because they feel they were left behind, and they were.
Yeah, absolutely. We, we should mention, uh, you know, we started the segment off talking about the new January 6th footage. Look, I think it's so important to make this available to the public so people can judge for themselves. Um, that is not to excuse any of the bad behavior that did go on that day. Uh, people being legitimately charged, in my view, for breaking and entering and other crimes. I am absolutely fine with that. But what went on there was used to indict an entire movement, an entire swath of people, and to and to describe them not just as rowdy or smashing windows, but actually as terrorists. And, and some people who weren't even there were charged, got the terrorism enhancement for what happened. So given that, that people are going to go to jail for 20 years for the events of January 6th, which again, to be clear, were very bad, and people should be people, I'm not for smashing windows of storefronts or Capitol buildings or people's houses. I want crime punished and dealt with. So I'm absolutely fine with that. But terrorism? Is it terrorism? Well, let's see the footage then. And what the footage shows is that a lot of people there felt like they were being they were being escorted by the police. The police weren't doing anything. They were on a tour of the Capitol. Again, you can make fun of them. You can say the people who did do uh, who 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 defaced public property and who fought with police. Absolutely, I want them to get um, uh, prison sentences. But this was made to be the most like evil, odious attack on America since 9/11. And you know, the, a lot of the footage we're seeing doesn't look like that to me. So we will continue to look into that and we'll have more rising right after this.